There's no need to get tense. Relax with Flux Condenser. Subscribe, baby, subscribe. Welcome to part two of the Ohm Walsh 2 speaker upgrade series. In the last video, I told you about the history of the Ohm Walsh 2 and how its unconventional design contributes to its unique imaging. I also told you about an upgrade kit that's available for the Walsh 2, which I ultimately decided to purchase. In this video, I'll show you how I installed the upgrade kit with some helpful tips and interesting bits along the way. It's fairly comprehensive and not just a quick how-to. If you're interested in stereo equipment though, vintage or otherwise, you'll probably find it interesting, even if you don't own an ohm speaker or have one with plans to upgrade. If that sounds good, make yourself comfortable and let's get started. The upgrade kit costs $1,400 and converts a pair of Ohm Walsh 2s into a pair of 2.2000s. Essentially, it replaces the old woofer, tweeter, and crossover from the originals with the newer ones found in Ohm's Walsh 2000 speakers. So you end up with a speaker cabinet that dates back to 1982 with the components of a speaker that was introduced in 2015, all with the promise of extended bass, higher, more defined treble, and an ability to play louder. About two and a half weeks after I placed the order, I received the upgrade kit, along with the two new grills, which I also ordered. More on those later. The kit came in one big box with three smaller boxes inside, along with some new damping material. Two of the smaller boxes each contained the new speaker modules, and the third contained the new input boards, screws, vent adapters, and instructions. Without an upgrade, Walsh 2s are rated for amplifiers up to 125 watts, have a 4 ohm impedance, and frequency response is from 42 to 17,000 hertz. Sensitivity is 88 decibels, and the recommended room size is 3,200 cubic feet. Looking at the kit's instructions, I was thanked for my purchase and informed that once upgraded, my speakers would now handle up to 200 watts, would have a slightly higher 6 ohm impedance, and an improved frequency response from 32 to 20,000 hertz. Sensitivity would remain the same at 88 decibels though, and the recommended room size was still about 3,000 cubic feet. The instructions also said that I'd need a hammer, chisel, wood glue, drill with 1 8 bit, and a Phillips screwdriver. You won't need the wood glue as Ohm actually makes no mention of it again, but you will need the other tools along with some others I'll recommend. If you don't have a chisel, a large flathead screwdriver will do the trick. Step 1 of the instructions simply tells you to disconnect the speakers from your stereo. Step 2 directs you to remove the outside grills and the four screws on each speaker holding the speaker drivers in place. What they don't tell you is that you'll also have to disconnect the drivers from the speaker's internal wiring. These are simple blade terminals and you can use a pair of pliers to disconnect them. Once you've set aside the old drivers, Step 3 asks that you remove the old damping fiber from inside the cabinet. My research tells me that this material can vary with the Walsh 2s, but mine had a puffy layer of cotton covering two sheets of insulation. Now that we've decapitated and disemboweled the speakers, Step 4 directs us to place them on their sides on a carpet or blanket. Steps 6 through 9 give very basic directions on how to remove the old input boards and to install the new boards, along with vent adapters, new damping material, and the new drivers. The instructions leave out a lot of details that may help with the installation, so I'll switch now from slideshow mode to some video demonstrations. Let's start with removing the old input board. Ohm suggests we do this with a hammer and chisel or block of wood. Here we go.
All right, if we compare the one I've already removed, we can see that I cut along this line here to be able to remove it. So why don't we do that? Why don't we uh, cut this here? Also, what's happening is this coil block on the other speaker was already detached. Um, and this, I'm um, looking at it, I don't know, is mounted approximately like this in the speaker and it is attached. And I think that's part of the resistance we're having with this panel here sitting up against this. So this will need to be dislodged as well. Um, so first let's see if we can cut this, work on getting this out, getting this part of the crossover removed. Um, yeah, and we're gonna have to, it's, it's, it's impossible to get out fully intact, it appears. Um, I mean, even obviously you have to cut it to get it out because it just doesn't fit through the hole. Uh, and it doesn't fit the other way either because of the bracing. So let's see what we can do. I'm going to cut this, uh, score it, bend it, cut it, whatever we can do, and go from there. <clears throat> so it's it's mounted on just uh, on really not a thick piece of cardboard at all. So using this little X-Acto might not seem enough to do the job, but yeah, it really is just a flimsy piece of, somewhat flimsy piece of cardboard. Um, so I'm cutting right through it without any real effort at all, even with this uh, small blade. Okay. So the top part is detached, and I'm just gonna see if I can pull this away. And cut down just a little bit, you know, quite a bit more actually to cut. So I'm just hacking my way down. And I've oh, got it all the way through. Okay. Can you see that? Alright. So let's see. Yeah. Um, that coil. There's a, some glue and remnants. Um, this coil here, which again, this is from the other, this is from the other uh, speaker, is mounted in the cabinet um, this way. So there's glue here. So it's mounted in there, and I guess it looks like this part is, I just wanna make sure you can see, this part is glued to the top of this board. Let me zoom out a little bit here. Okay. Is glued sort of as such right about right about there. So now this coil is connected to the uh, main crossover here. Set those wires and do it relatively close to the end of the crossover, uh, I mean, to the, maximize the length of these, um, these wires coming out of the coil, just in case I want to use it again for some reason. Who knows? And this is connected, these are connected to those caps. Okay. So we need to get the coil out and the main board. This is from the old speaker, looks like this. And so it's basically in there right now, like this. Now I was able to get this out um, of here with only this much cut off. So let me work with doing that now. Let's see if I can finagle that out somehow. Here it comes. Brand new baby crossover. Maybe. Yeah, a breach birth there. <laughs> turn, turn our patient around a little bit. Uh, come on. I know this worked before. It's basically twins here. Come on.
And you know, to make this easier, you could cut more of this board. I mean, I could uh, do all sorts of things to make this easier. I'm trying to preserve this uh, as much as possible. So it's taking a little longer. There we go. Okay. That's out. And the wires. All right, so yeah, not bad. All right, now we've got this coil. Okay. How do we knock that guy out? Yeah. All right. Jeez, it was kind of um, good fortune in a way uh, as far as removing the crossover that that had sort of knocked its way out sort of naturally on the other one. And we're gonna have to force matters here on this one. Okay, so that block is um, glued right here. And it's also glued here to just the actual um, board, I believe, this paper, uh, cardboard board. So we need to, I'm gonna try to dislodge this first. Uh, they recommend a chisel. I first, when I did the other one, I thought that was extreme, but now I see what they mean. Um, I'll try to release that uh, bond here in the coil. All right, that's a little better. Okay, that is releasing. Didn't take too much effort. The coil is now loose. And there you go. Looks like, um, so the rest of this uh, piece of, um, I guess, iron is um, still in there attached to the, um, the cardboard. Okay, which is uh, stapled and glued to this piece. That may have just broke, it may have been damaged before, I really don't know um, what happened. But yeah, very difficult to get these out with this, uh, I don't know, is it, um, is it just ceramic or is it ceramic and iron? I really don't know. So let's see if we can get that remaining bit out. Again, I'm just going to try to use my hands as much as possible so I don't damage the cabinet. There's the other piece. You know, you could technically leave all this in because the, the new crossover um, kind of goes in flush and mounts from the outside. I'll show you that. Okay, here's the new... Actually, this isn't the... Um, crossover this is the just the base actuator they call it uh just a tuned circuit to uh, boost the low frequencies if you choose um this is the middle is the flat position this would augment it the the base and this would sort of subtract so depending on your room conditions okay but we're gonna start off on the mid position <laughs> that's to mimic the um the base uh the base uh, control on the original one which had an increase for lows, uh, average, they call it average, but that would be sort of the, sort of the mid, um, mm, unequalized position and decrease. The old one had also um, a frequency increase for the highs, but this, uh, the new one doesn't do that. Um, so you'll also notice that um, this is a much simpler circuit than this and that's not just because it's you know lacking the the high um, equalization but also because this actually has um, the um, crossover for the woofer and tweeter so you can see running up from this there are three wires okay so you get your common and then one for the base and uh, one for the base driver one for the, the high frequency driver one for the woofer one for the tweeter that's because the crossover is here. On this newer unit, you'll notice there's only two wires going up to the, the cylinder, which, con which contains both the base driver, the woofer, and the tweeter. 
And that is because that in the new can, I call it a can, the crossover is actually mounted inside. So, but I'm not about to take that apart to, uh, to prove it. I'll take uh, Owen's assurance what's going on in there, okay? So again, as I was saying, this would just mount like this on the outside. You can see I can drop that in very easily right now. Of course, this would go on the inside. So you could leave all this junk in here, but I would not recommend it. I would get as much of this out as, as possible. You don't want loose debris in there. You don't want something that's gonna rattle. So yeah, get get all that uh, that remaining cardboard out there as best you can. Okay. In fact, this uh, a spider had apparently got in here, built a little bit of a nest inside the cabinet. So we're gonna blow this whole thing out as best we can to get rid of all these cobwebs. You know, when you have a uh, speaker that's sitting on the floor <laughs> with a port, not only not only going to get all these cobwebs, but you're also going to get critters uh, that might decide to uh, make a home out of this. So, you know, it's always a risk. You could have a mouse create a nest in, in a speaker like this, uh, all sorts of things. Um, I guess you could put a put a grill <laughs> a grill on the top of this um, this tube to prevent the bigger critters. But yeah, spiders are always going to get in there. All right, so fortunately, no no rat droppings or anything like that, because uh, mouse droppings, because that could really ruin something like this, just a spider. And I'm just gonna keep working to remove this. Okay. All right. So there's that. Piece of, uh, it's a piece of cardboard still attached to the, to the staple. I'm not gonna go through too much trouble to remove a staple. That's not gonna make any noise as long as it's in there. Well, but I would like to get this last bit out of cardboard. Yeah. All right, All right feels clean. All right, we'll stop the video for now and um, I'll continue to just clean this out a little bit and blow out the inside. All right, who needs uh, cans of compressed air when you have a DataVac electric duster? I'm gonna use this to blow out some of these cobwebs here. Just saw this floating around in there. Yeah, you can't really see it, but there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of debris blowing out the other end over there. All right, let's turn it around. Uh, these clips that were used to secure the old, again, I call it a can, the canister um, are, are not gonna be used. So I would not leave those in there so that the, so the new one can sit flush. And again, you don't want anything in there uh, in a cabinet that could potentially rattle. So let's remove those now. And we'll set those aside. So these are just the clips like that. Okay, pull this out a little bit more. All right, let's let uh, gravity help us a little bit and bring this down. want to make sure that there's nothing left in the cabinet that could rattle. So, you know, as you saw, there were pieces uh, like this, okay, that were in there. Now we've blown it out, but who's to say there could still be a piece in there that could rattle. Um, we're also, there were pieces of uh, glue and things like that. So, if you're able to, <laughs> Pick up the cabinet, okay? And right away I can hear there's still something rattling there. So if you have the strength, pick it up and just shake out whatever's in there. Okay, and I can see two pieces that just fell out. Okay, three pieces now. All right. And now there's still one more piece actually. Still, we got rid of most of the rattle. There's still something in there rattling. Gonna keep shaking that up. 
The speaker enclosure should be dead silent. Okay. And not a bad idea just to do a wrap test, make sure it's solid, uh, check the braces inside, make sure nothing's loose, even check the baseboard tube, the cardboard tube, make sure that's in there nice and solid. And let me just pick up the pieces that we shook out to show you what was still in there. So yeah, just some of uh, these ceramic or iron uh, pieces from the from the uh, coil. Those pieces were still in there. Oh, I'm a little out of breath from picking up the speaker and shaking it. All right. Okay, now that we've got the uh, old crossover removed and cabin and all cleaned up, why don't we go ahead and install the the new tune circuit with the coil and capacitors. Once this is built and you want to change it, you actually do have to remove this uh, this module, the which has also the uh, binding post for the speakers. So there'll be four screws, a lot easier to access than the other one. Um, again, the old um, crossover also uh, provided uh, bass enhancement and treble enhancement and provided switches on the outside. So it was a little bit easier, but that's the, uh, the choice they decided to make on this one, to not put the switch on the outside. Not sure why. Certainly could have been done. <laughs> make things a little easier, but I guess the uh, the bonus is that once you set it, nobody's going to change it and won't accidentally get changed if it was, I don't know, rubbing on the carpet or what have you. But uh, easy to forget that this switch is there if you were to purchase these and perhaps they were in a position you didn't want um, if you purchased them you say you may not even know that that switch that option is available to you so hmm i don't know questionable design not a not a great choice as far as i'm concerned but let's go with it okay so now that we have um the panel in place um what i would recommend doing is to uh, also to uh, help make this as secure as possible and to align it is to actually push the frame of this right up against the, the edge of the front in here. So it sits just so, and then sort of just center it between the two feet. We're gonna get an eighth, eighth inch drill. And then we're gonna drill one hole first. the uh, screws that Ohm provides. Get that one started. Okay. We have our first screw in. Okay, and you can go all the way, all the way through with the um, with the drill bit. Okay, just partially. So we now we have the two corners secured. I would recommend using this method to, to, to drill your holes, uh, using the actual board as your guide for the drill bit. Um, this is wood, so you don't have to worry about marring it or scratching it, or just put your drill bit right through. If you try to uh, use the, it's a very small hole, if you try to mark these holes with a pen, you're gonna have a hard time getting the pen in there. I guess you could use a nail and tap it, but why bother? Just get the first one started uh, and then do the rest of them, okay? But as you can see, I'm not going to tighten these screws until I have all the holes uh, drilled and all the screws in position.
So with this upgrade kit, Ohm provides uh, all new screws. Um, hmm, many more than you would actually need. <laughs> and, uh, which is nice, but, um, and they seem to be the same exact screws as the originals from the, um, from the 80s. Let's see. Yeah, these are the um, newly provided screws and these are the uh, originals, so exactly the same. Uh, yeah, nice screws. These would be nice to have around. It looks like I'm going to have quite a few extras. All right, let's finish tightening this up. do one final cinch in the screws I would just say be careful don't over tighten these screws again to access the um, the base enhancement switch you may be taking this in and out this is just uh, some type of particle board honestly you can only thread a screw into these so many times before they uh, start getting loose um, I've had this happen many times with speakers and it can be a real real pain in the neck um, so yeah don't overly tighten them Tighten them, keep the holes in good shape. If you overly tighten them, you're gonna start distorting the thread and that particle board is gonna start pulling apart. Okay, so that's good enough. Great. So the next thing they provide is the uh, sort of a uh, plastic, uh, well, let me get the instructions. What do they call it? The vent adapter. Number seven on the assembly instructions, install the vent adapter by sliding it into the old vent until it is flush to the outside of the bottom board. So whatever reason, they're just giving you sort of a, I would say just a cosmetic upgrade over this, uh, this, this hole, this simple hole to a little plastic just to make it a little bit, a uh, little more aesthetic. I guess uh, they might claim that it provides some type of a uh, smoothing effect to the, um, to the sound waves as they're coming out. But um, I don't know. One of the things that does happen though, when you put this inside the tube is it does create a sort of a, an edge, which you could argue maybe create some type of turbulence too. So I'm not sure that's the best thing because the, you have the, the round tube inside, which is smooth and then it hits this right before it exits. So I'm not sure that's the best either, but again, we'll go with it. <laughs> so this uh, foam, that you'll see that they come uh, comes packaged with with the with the masking tape. Um, yeah, that's not just protection. You need to install it with this, otherwise the um, this cap will not fit correctly. Okay, so leave that in place and just get it started. Okay, and uh, then what I found best to do is sort of just use a small flathead to just guide that um, foam in there so it doesn't get too bunched up. Um, you want it to go in completely and uh, smoothly so that you don't have this foam bubbling out on the side. Okay, and this needs to be flush, so just push that in as you go as opposed to just jamming the cap in there. When you start getting close, I would recommend sort of turning it if you can to get that in there to help really twist the uh, foam in place. Make sure it's not bubbling out the side. Okay, and just give it a good final push, turning it and pushing in as you go. There you have it in place. Okay, let's move on to installing the uh, the speaker canister on the top. Okay, before we um, install the cans, let's take a moment just to compare the uh, original speaker module, okay, with the woofer and tweeter, with the new one. You can see in the original, four wires, okay, coming out of the uh, can. Now they go again this way down into the um, into the enclosure. Okay, so this part is, is uh, facing up and out. 
this goes down, this uh, woofer fires down into the um, enclosure. Let's take this apart. <laughs> So again, you can see the woofer, which fires downward. I had heard or read some discussions that this base unit was somehow different than an ordinary uh, woofer. And uh, I don't know, looks pretty basic to me. Just looks like a regular woofer that's facing downward instead of out and has a tweeter glued to the top, okay? And a bunch of foam. All right, so inside you can see the tweeter Okay, and it has some absorbing material to absorb the sound from the, the bottom of the, the tweeter output. And the woofer uh, is allowed to deflect sound in an outward pattern. Okay, and as far as inside the can, this is the foam. And the can is uh, positioned this way. Okay, and on top. So again, what you're getting is a reduction of the sound output to the rear. This foam also um, reduces the output uh, to the rear of the speaker from the woofer as well. So, and I think it's a good idea. Sometimes when speakers are too omnidirectional and they're, you know, bouncing sound all over the place, you get uh, a lot of strange reflections and sound delays and things like that. And you start really hearing the reflections from the back of the room can really color the sound that you hear from the listening position. So Ohm wisely tried to pick a, um, and I think it works quite well with their, with their designs. Um, you're getting a little bit of the uh, reflections um, from this sort of somewhat omnidirectional uh, arrangement, but the rear uh, output is highly reduced so you're only getting a, a flavor of it flavor of it but not it's not competing with the the front output uh, and it works really quite well these uh speakers have a uh, kind of a unique sound not necessarily unique sound quality but a unique presence in the room and they do they claim that you know no matter where you position in the room you can hear both the left and right speakers all the time even if you're up close to the right speaker say you can still hear the output of the left and yeah, to a certain extent, that's true. They do they do image differently than uh, a typical front firing speaker, and uh, the effect is is really quite pleasant. All right. So again, that's how the old one looks. The um, new one is uh, I'm really not sure. I haven't been able to see any drawings or diagrams of this uh, newer module, but I uh, I suspect it's similar. There's going to be uh, a base unit such as like this, apparently the one in the new one can, is uh, capable of uh, producing uh, more output and uh, can go down to lower frequencies. Um, there's supposedly improvements in the tweeter as well. And the, the additional difference between uh, the newer module and the older one would be uh, also the addition of the crossover assembly, which uh, is apparently, well, which I know is um, enclosed within this enclosure. There's a um, crossover assembly. And again, that's why you have just two wires going in here, whereas the old one, you had the, the four wires because these would go down through the cabinet to the crossover at the, at the bottom where the speaker posts are, okay? Also, you can see here, there's uh, protection here. 
for the circuit. Interesting fuses, they almost look like bulbs, but these apparently are being used as um, overload protection for the, for the unit, for both the base and for the tweeter. So it's kind of a nice touch. Although if you were to blow these, you, there's no resettable switch. These would have to be replaced, okay? Uh, one additional feature of the new speaker uh, module is the addition of this big giant dent, as you can see. Can you see that? Yep, big giant dent. <laughs> now I'm just joking. This is not a feature, this is a mistake. And when I received the uh, upgrade kit, this can uh, arrive this way, dented in. I talked to Ohm and they're sending me out um, two new ones, okay? I haven't received those yet. So I have the old ones. The other one I installed, it had just a slight dent, but barely perceptible. Nonetheless, Ohm is sending me two new ones. So when I get the, the second new one, I may elect to swap it out with the one that's already installed. This one though is, is completely unacceptable as you can see. So dented cans <laughs> with these Ohm, these Ohm cylinders is uh, very, very common, you know? In fact, uh, again, this one, when I purchased it was dented in. By taking it apart, I was able to push it back in position. Again, that's why I decided to open this one up, just to get a, it was a good opportunity. It needed to be rebuilt anyway, and a good opportunity to see what was going on inside. So, all right. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to use this one um, as a template for the uh, for the new screws. And But when the new one comes, we will replace it with the non-dented version, okay? And I expect that in the next couple of days. I will say Ohm was was uh, very pleasant about it on the phone. They're great guys to talk with. If you ever need to call them, call their Brooklyn office. And uh, they seem to be very patient and, and they'll answer your questions. So I had a good experience with that. Not such a great experience with spending this much money on, on an upgrade kit to have a uh, can like this delivered in this condition. Uh, Ohm, I will say, just putting this out there, said that there was no way that this can was packed this way, okay? And that the damage, according to them, absolutely absolutely happened during shipping. Uh, <clears throat> I will tell you this, Ohm does a very good job packaging this upgrade kit, okay? Everything was double boxed. I will also tell you that there was no, absolutely no evidence whatsoever that the boxes were damaged in any way. There were no creases in the box, whether on the external box or the internal box, where this can would be positioned. My honest opinion, these were packed this way, okay? My honest opinion is, and I could be wrong, is that Ohm shipped this out to me. Somehow this slipped through their quality control and it didn't happen in shipping. I, you know, buy a lot of things on eBay and, you know, I've gotten to know when things are damaged, uh, something like this is going to happen. There's there's going to be clear evidence of that on the exterior package, okay? And, and there was none, okay? Uh, and also something like this would be due to uh, poor packaging. It's, it's, for example, not double boxed. Again, this was double boxed. Nonetheless, uh, not a big deal. Ohm is uh, shipping out new ones. They said that when I receive the new ones, I will receive uh, prepaid shipping containers for, to send the old ones back. So not a big deal, a minor inconvenience, but yeah, Ohm is a, they're a good company and they stand by their product. Okay, let's prepare the cabinet to install the um, new speaker module. The positioning of this uh, driver unit is, is um, very important. Um, and you can't just install it any which way, obviously, okay? Uh, the instructions are, are okay, but they perhaps could have been a, a little bit more uh, descriptive in, um, dis in the describing the correct way to position these things. There are a couple things that I encountered doing the first one that I'll review with you that aren't really discussed that well in the instructions. Um, and so hopefully I can give you a couple of tips. They do say, make sure that the bundle of wires coming out of the drivers is in the corner opposite the logo badges, okay? So looking at the module from the top down, you will notice that again, there's this uh, bundle of wires coming out of here. You should see a red one and a black one. Okay, this indicates the general uh, sort of back area of the module. Back meaning opposite the direction that the tweeter is firing, okay? 
So inside this module, the, the tweeter is, is roughly positioned about here and it is firing this way, okay? That's the correct way when the uh, speaker itself is aligned so that the Ohm logo is here and the Walsh 2 logo is here. So that's roughly where you want it. Ohm again indicates that this bundle of wires should be located in this corner, okay? Opposite the logos. However, there is a, um, I still think there's a better way to do it and that's the way I, in I indicated by uh, creating a diagonal line. If the um, logos are in this corner and this is the back, you're gonna create a diagonal line um, on the top of the uh, cabinet with, you know, slightly with the pencil so you can erase it later from this point to this point, okay? And that's going to give you the, the, the sort of the line at which this tweeter um, should be positioned with within, okay? So in other words, you could, you know, you could get it like this so that the tweeter's firing here or here and you want it to fire directly into this corner. Now, if you use the bundle of wire suggestion that they use to get this in the um, corner, this would actually be a little bit offset from, from the ideal position. It would be a little bit off to the side. Um, you might notice if you look closely that the actual hole where the wires come out from the, from the screened area is actually closer to uh, this midpoint, but the hole that goes down is a little bit offset. And if you're you know, um, a perfectionist like me and you wanna get it just right, this is the method I suggest. You use your diagonal line and you uh, rotate the speaker so that the, you'll see that there's a hole here and a hole here. And align um, the module so that the, uh, the holes are perfectly centered over the line that you drew. And I have found by, by looking inside again, this module with a flashlight that, uh, that indeed that the speaker tweeter is aligned perfectly from this hole to this hole. So that's a good, um, good way to do it. All right, so now we have that diagonal line. We know that this is the, um, the perpendicular line for the tweeter firing directly this way, right? Now we know that the perpendicular line for the tweeter in the actual assembly, it goes from this screw to this screw. So let's use those screw holes to align it. Yeah. Now our tweeter is firing directly to this uh, corner, okay? Which is what you want. You don't want it pointing here or there. And the new module will be secured with six screws, okay? And they actually, they won't even be down here in this sort of uh, recessed area. The, the screws are actually gonna be out here, okay? And that presents a little bit of a difficulty um, that I think if you don't sort of prepare this cabinet the way that I'm gonna suggest, may end up giving you some troubles, okay? Now, perhaps you see the problem. <laughs> when I first saw this, I realized, okay, there's just, if you just follow um, Ohm's instructions and you just drill a hole here, you're going to have a mess. Okay, I can't just I can't just drill a hole and drill that through there. It's going to start chewing up this corner. Okay, in this corner, this corner, and this corner, and this corner. Ohm again, <laughs> great company, but uh, this alignment is a little mm, not the best. I'll just say that. Okay, so what I did on the first one. I used um, this sort of router bit, okay, on the Dremel to open up this, these areas where the screw is going to go. Again, um, if I just, can you see that? If I just drill a hole and screw into this, all this wood is gonna splinter, the drill bit's going to slip, and it's gonna be just a mess, okay? This is, you know, a nice precision piece of audio gear. It's a classic. <laughs> it's uh, uh, collectible. Let's not do that. Let's do it right. If you don't have a router bit such as this, you might be able to use an X-Acto blade, perhaps a, a, bigger than, a bigger one than this, to work out a um, sort of a slot in these. Okay, something. 
but don't just go start drilling in there. You're gonna, it's not gonna work, okay? I'll give you, I'll sh show you what would happen. I'm not gonna do it, but yeah, if I try to reach that that lip right there and I, and I uh, hit power on the drill, the, the drill bit's gonna slide and it's gonna be all over the place, okay? So, we're gonna, again, use the router bit to open up a slot to allow a better passageway for the uh, screws, okay? So you want to keep working the router, okay, so that you've removed all of the pencil mark that you uh, drew with the hole, okay? And don't go through at this point. Don't use the router to drill the hole. Just go to this level here, okay? That will be done with the drill bit. So there's one. And now when we drill our hole, the drill bit will go nice and cleanly that way, okay? We've got a good solid position for it. The drill bit will lock in place and go straight through without getting thrown off this edge. And when we put our screw in, it'll go straight through and won't get knocked off this edge as well. And we'll have a nice clean hole, okay? So let me uh, do the rest of the holes. We'll put the module on top and we'll double check and, and make sure we've uh, allowed for enough of an opening. Chances are we haven't, we'll have to go back, but let's just see where we're at. Um, be very careful with the rotter. You need to have a very, very firm grip. Be careful, don't get your hand on, on the bit. That's not gonna be good. Get as close, however, as you can to this part of the, uh, the Dremel, as close to the bit as you can, so that otherwise this head is gonna zigzag all over the place as soon as that hits that wood, okay? Have a very, very good grasp and slowly, slowly work your way in. Don't let this bit jump all around and make a mess. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, now to start, just to make sure that we, um, I can get the, um, drill the holes in the absolute right spot. Let me, um, instead of putting the drill through, let me see if I can thread the screws in a little bit since we have that nice uh, groove to uh, center them um, and see if we can get a, um, a more accurate starting point for the holes. Let's see if this will grab. So there's no pilot hole, so just push down. There's one. And go to the opposite side. And just do a little bit, don't go too far in, because we want to make sure that these are in their correct positions case we need to make some changes. Okay. Just use those as a starting point. And let's drill some nice clean pilot holes that go uh, straight down. All right. There we go. Okay, one here. Yeah, nice and straight down. Straight down. I 
But yeah, you can see there's not much here. There's just a little bit of material between where these screws go in. Put one in here. And the edge, okay? So another good reason to use the pilot hole, if we go straight through with the screw uh, without the hole there, it may be too tight and it could actually cause us to separate and bulge out. So good idea to use the 1 8 pilot hole. Also, we never did connect this. Uh, again, not an issue because we're not going to uh, be using this module. When we get the, the non-dented one, we'll, we'll do it. But, you know, if we plug it in now, we can um, listen to it, make sure everything sounds halfway decent. Um, although I haven't put the padding in yet either. So why don't we just get this right? And um, I won't even bother plugging it in because let's just make sure this is nice and secure. Then we'll take it out and then we'll review how to put the uh, acoustic uh, padding inside. Secure our screws. Okay, yeah, seems to be a good fit. Again, as I said, with the uh, the binding posts, with the screws, uh, don't over tighten these screws, especially for me at this point, since um, I, this has to come out, I still have to do the foam. Um, this isn't the actual module we're gonna use. Again, protect these, um, these threaded holes that we've now made and uh, uh, work with them very gingerly. Okay, I'm just going to just tighten them enough to make sure that everything is sitting flush and I'm not going to not going to over tighten them, especially at this point. Okay. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Seems to be flush. Okay, let's install the damping material inside the speaker enclosure. And now, Ohm provides you with a new material to use. The reason for damping material inside a speaker enclosure, well, there, there are many reasons. Typically, a larger, uh, a mid to large uh, size um, enclosure for, for a full range speaker will, will have padding. To sort of tune the enclosure, uh, that gets very complicated by, but by the um, amount of material used and the position you can sort of shape the, the, the tune of the, um, of the enclosure, and that has to do with uh, resonances and uh, how uh, frequencies sort of uh, propagate and uh, reinforce one another. And um, another reason sometimes too is just to, uh, reduce the, um, to reduce the transmission of the waves, okay, to the cabinet itself. And this can sometimes be described as sort of that boxy sound where the cabinet itself is resonating. And so sometimes um, damping material is used along the walls to sort of uh, reduce that effect as well. The uh, original material with the old walls shoes had uh, this um, kind of a little bit denser material. I'm not sure what it is. Um, and I believe they were too, and it's sort of reinforced a little bit with this uh, mesh plastic. Uh, I believe that, yeah, there were two pieces of this. And then on top of that, they had this sort of loose uh, synthetic cotton material. Okay. And that's not to be reused. And um, you're supposed to just use this new material that they, that they have. Okay. So uh, Ohm's instructions say, 
uh, install the new damping pads, eight to 10 inches from the top of the cabinet. Be sure that the edges of the damping pads reach all the way to the inner side walls of the cabinet with no gaps in the corners, okay? So yeah, we wanna tuck this in. Wanna make sure that, for example, if this was the wall, there's no uh, openings or holes, okay? If this was the corner, we wanna make sure that it's not flapped up, okay? So it's gotta really cover uh, all four walls, okay? And eight to 10 inches, uh, well, I use this guide real quick. I just uh, created a mark here from eight to 10 down, which brings us between, eight to 10 inches is really between the um, this top reinforcement um, bar, okay? And the second one, okay? So somewhere between those, if you can see that, is the approximate uh, correct range. So what we could try to do is, I did this on the first one, and as I recall, I, I did try to get it to go in between these two reinforcement um, blocks, and I wasn't successful. Um, and I think what I ended up doing was just sort of tucking this one end on top here and then folding it down. Let me try that again. Let me see if I can get it uh, in between these two blocks so that when the pad is installed, this block would be on top, okay? And I may not be able to do that. Yeah, it's very hard. Not sure where they came up with the magic eight to 10 inch number because it... Kind of puts it in a spot that's uh, actually difficult to achieve. But that's not too bad, actually. So again, that brings us pretty much right there. Yeah, all the sides are covered. I'm just making sure that it tucks up in the corner as well. Seems to work best if you uh, push the center down and have the corners more in an upper position. I don't know if that's sort of a sort of a concave uh, bowl-like shape. Um, mm, seems to be the best way to make sure that the uh, padding uh, is aligned well along all four edges and four corners. So I'm pretty comfortable with that. Uh, that's right in the eight to 10 range. Uh, again, hopefully you can see that. Um, this is our cable coming up. And just wanna make sure that when the cable is in position where it's gonna be sort of pulled up a little bit that that um, is still, the foam is still surrounding that cable well, okay? Yeah, that's pretty good. Let's go with that. As expected, I received a package from Ohm Acoustics. They promised it early in the week, and um, yeah, they got it to me pretty quickly. This is going to contain the uh, replacements for the speaker modules um, that were dented. They were first sent to me, and they were dented. This one, you can see, uh, had a pretty good dent in it. So. I called home and they're going to replace the uh, said they would replace it these are the replacements this one they said this one really barely has any problems with it uh, i mean there's a slight dent here but i would have accepted that but home um decided to send me two new ones so what we'll do is we'll open these up if these are good and no dents then we'll install them and we'll pack up the old ones and send them back to home this box is in um, good condition okay no dents no dings so let's open it up and inspect the new modules. Okay. And as I said before, they double boxed everything, which is the best way to do it, obviously. Good job, Ohm. Second box out. Let's examine this box. Yeah, it looks good. No indications of any issues with shipment. Let's open it up. Okay. It's actually triple boxed, quadruple boxed. All right. So we have two more boxes here. Each one containing a module. Ooh. I expected to pick this up and have the, the whole 
box pull out with one containing the module, but it looks like it's sort of just capped on. So let's look at that. it a little differently this time. Looks like they mounted, uh, yeah, they mounted both uh, modules, uh, speaker modules, to uh, to a wood board to secure it in shipping. And I'm just looking at the cans. Yep, and they look good, no dents. Let's see if I can manage to get this out of here now without denting them <laughs> myself. Yeah, it looks good. I wonder if um, wonder if Ohm, because of the issue that I had, has uh, opted to uh, take a different um, approach with shipping these by mounting them to the board that way. Um, yeah, they did a nice job. I love that. Looks good. Great. Very well secured. Good job, Ohm, again. And uh, yeah, thanks for taking care of that for me. Uh, these look great. These will now be installed on the wood cabinets and then they're ready to go. Plug them in, install them, and um, uh, then a couple of things we're gonna, I'm gonna show you that the, the new um, grills that I have for the uh, the tops, talk to you a little bit about that, and then maybe we'll put a little, um, uh, something a little wood, for these cabinets are in great shape, the wood is in great shape, but, um, so they certainly don't need to be refinished, but we can um, polish them up a little bit and maybe we'll do that as well. Okay, it's time to polish up the uh, cabinet of the uh, Walsh 2, and I figured uh, why don't we have some fun with this. I have a few different products that I use to bring back to life or just add a little shine and protection to cabinets that are in you know good shape that don't don't require to be completely refinished. And I was looking at them and said, geez, I've acquired quite a few of these over the years. I wonder which one actually works best. So why don't we do a test? So what we're going to do is I've, dis I've divided the uh, cabinet, one side of the cabinet, into four quadrants, okay, separated by the uh, by masking tape. And as you can see, I've marked uh, what product we're going to use on each quadrant. Actually, in this area here, the one with the logo, we're not going to treat it. So we'll have an opportunity to compare uh, the other ones, um, the shine to the other ones. And of course, if we lift the masking tape afterwards, uh, we'll get a chance to see uh, the edge. So uh, just to see if these products are worth it, uh, if we're better off just leaving it alone, and uh, we'll go from there. So um, the Parker and Bailey Lemon Oil, which will go here, and the Scott's Liquid Gold are designed really just, you know, just a quick apply them, rub them in a little bit, and then remove the excess. So we'll do that with these two, okay? And note too, I will be using a different cloth. Okay, I have a cloth for this, and I have a cloth for this for each uh, section, that way there's no contamination. Um, on the Howard Feed and Wax, this one suggests leaving it on for 20 minutes and then rubbing off the excess. So we'll actually do that. We'll just follow the instructions from the manufacturer. These guys will, will apply and remove excess. This one will let sit for 20 uh, minutes before we uh, remove the excess. Why don't we get going with the uh, Howard Feed and Wax first. Again, here's what that looks like. Uh, it says it's a wood polish and conditioner, beeswax and orange oil, a penetrating feeder and to polish for all furniture finishes and natural woods. All right, let's give it a shake. Okay, we have a little more. Just to make sure we've got it covered well. There. Okay. Now we're going to do the uh, Parker and Bailey uh, Lemon Oil Polish. The label says uh, Parker and Bailey trusted wood care since 1879. A Maine tradition. I guess they're from Maine. <laughs> Lemon Oil Polish cleans and renews wood surfaces, penetrates and replaces 
Woods Natural Oils. Leaves a fresh lemon scent. All right, let's give that a try. Let's put a little squirt on there. Okay, let me just uh, let that sit for a sec and uh, let's move on and we'll um, apply the uh, Scott's Liquid Gold. Scott's Liquid Gold says natural oils, natural shine, pourable. Scott's Liquid Gold Wood Care nourishes to protect, cleans and dusts throughout your home. Fresh almond scent, okay. Give that a shake. It says pourable, so let's pour a little bit on there. Oop, okay. That should be more than enough. And we'll spread that. Okay. And just let that sit. Okay. Let's start removing the excess of the um, Parker and Bailey lemon oil polish. Yeah, and just a note with these products, um, you know, this looks great when you pour it on because it's wet. And obviously everything looks great when it's wet, you know, <laughs> fills in all the imperfections, gives it a nice shine. But uh, yeah, you don't want to leave it like this or, or this because that's just greasy and it's going to pick up fingerprints. So you really do, um, even though it looks great, you got you to gotta remove all that excess. And that's what we're doing here. Seems good. Let's move on and let's remove the uh, excess from the Scott's Liquid Gold in this corner. Okay, pretty good. Um, just looking at them quickly. Um, I don't know. These three all sort of look the same. Um, the Scott's Liquid might have a little bit more shine than the lemon oil. It's hard to say. Um, and yeah, these two seem to be a li little bit shinier than the untreated. Okay. Uh, the Howard Feeding Wax requires 20 minutes of sitting, so let's uh, pause the video here and I'll come back in 20 minutes or so and uh, we'll wipe that down and we'll compare all four, see if there's a difference. Okay, it's been about a half an hour. Um, why don't we finish polishing up the, uh, the Howard Feeding Wax, remove the excess. Just touch it to make sure it's not too greasy. Yeah, it definitely has kind of a, a waxy finish, but it's uh, it's not greasy. And, um, doesn't seem to be picking up fingerprints. Over here, I think I got a little bit of the Howard feet on the untreated. So I try to disregard that spot. So what do we what do we see here? Do we see a difference in the quality? Um, quickly looking at it, I would say. Yeah, I think we have a winner. In fact, there's only one that I can see that was actually worth the trouble. 
the liquid gold, you know, it probably cleaned it up a little bit. Um, but not a heck of a lot of difference between the untreated and the uh, liquid gold. It is a little bit shinier, which is good, however. So not a complete waste of effort. But with a finish like this, you're not going to see a huge improvement. And by this, I mean, you know, a finish that's in good condition. The Parker & Bailey Lemon Oil is a hair shinier than the Scots. So I would say um, a little bit better than the Scots, but not much. And the Howard Feed and Wax uh, appears to be the clear winner. It's definitely shinier than, shinier than the others, and it has a richer tone. Of course, this took 20 minutes per the instructions. Would the others have done as well? Uh, if they sat for 20 minutes, they probably would have done better, but my impression is that the, uh, the regardless of the time the, that you let this sit on there, uh, the, the Howard Feeding Wax is, is, is a better product and it's going to leave a deeper shine. I'm going to now remove the tape so that we can better see if there's a sort of a defined edge between the products. Yes, this is rather eye-opening. Okay, yeah, you can clearly see the, um, the cross from the tape. You can actually even see the difference between where the, the tape was and the unfinished, so clearly the tape is either cleaning the wood a little bit or it's leaving a little bit of a residue. But um, yeah, I think you, hopefully in the video, you can clearly see that this quadrant here is much shinier and the other three are, well, this is, these are very close, definitely shinier than these, um, but this is the clear winner. And that again is the Howard Feed and Wax. Let me just um, move the light around a little bit so you can see that. Okay. And I can even, See if you can see a difference in the gloss. One thing I did notice between the untreated and this quadrant here with the liquid gold is that the the when I shine this uh, light on there, which I believe is halogen or LED, pro actually probably LED, um, the light is whiter than it is here. You can see, I hope maybe you can see that. So um, perhaps that's because it's um, the uh, the coating on top is reflecting better. Um, and reflecting more of the white, the white light from the LED, whereas this is you're seeing more of the yellow cast of the wood. Uh, and over here, even whiter, uh, even whiter light than here, so perhaps even more reflection. And then interestingly, when you go to the the feed in wax, which is uh, undeniably the shinier and the glossier. Um, you're not getting the, the white, you're actually getting more of the yellow cast, which is closer to the, the actual natural wood. So not, not only is the uh, feed in wax uh, reflecting more, but it's actually preserving more of the, the yellowish uh, tones of the, of the wood, and it's kind of maintaining that yellowish cast compared to these, which are whiter. So, you know, depending on the room and the light, that could actually make a difference. So, yeah, my recommendation to you is if you want something quick, um, Either use the lemon polish or the, the Scots liquid gold, not much difference. Uh, good products, but don't expect uh, too much. Powered feed and wax, uh, 20 minutes, let it set, wipe it off. Uh, works really well. I'm impressed. I'm going to go ahead now and uh, refinish all of these with the, uh, with the feed and wax. Okay, well, we're almost ready for the moment of truth. Uh, in a little bit, I'm going to take the speakers into the other room. We're going to hook them up into the, um, the uh, gym antique stereo system and um, give them a try. Before we do that, I just wanted to show you how they polished up, uh, looking nice. And uh, one more thing, I want to show you the um, optional uh, grill uh, covers that I got for these. This is the original um, that Ohm provides with the, Ohm provided with the Ohm Walsh shoes from back in the 80s. You can see it's more of a brownish color. And uh, these have actually fared pretty well considering these tend to uh, get damaged easily. Um, these speakers are very top heavy for one and the, you know, they do have a tendency of uh, tipping over so I, uh, one caveat about them um, would be to I wouldn't recommend them if you have a little, little kids running around in the house because these are likely to go over so as a consequence just because of the way these sit 
they get grabbed, they fall, they get pinched. People are curious uh, what's going on, and um, you know this one, for example, has a uh, has a hole in it here, and you know they just overall get faded water sp water spots. People put a beer on it, what have you. So Ohm has um, they still provide even if you don't get the um, the the two thousand upgrade, um, you can still buy alternate. Um, uh, newly uh, newly revamped uh, speaker grill uh, uh, covers uh, and and I did that so I just want to show you this is what the original looks like okay and these are the uh, replacements and these are available for purchase on Ohm's website they're more sturdy they're they're black so they're a darker color and it's uh, you know probably less likely to fade and um, maybe better better able to conceal um, you know stains or spots or what have you yeah, a little bit more rigid, um, and they have a bit of a cleaner look. They fit more more tightly, and they're going to look like that. So just to give you a chance to to see what the difference is between the two, you know, in some ways, I sort of prefer the the old look uh, with the brown. I actually think the brown actually kind of sort of blends in better um, with the cabinets, and I think it has sort of a more of that '80s look to it, but. Yeah, the black looks nice too, and um, the grill cloths on mine really needed to be replaced, so I figured I might as well go and, and do that. But um, yeah, we'll see. I should get used to the black. Um, they certainly look uh, sleeker for sure. Now that we've updated all the parts, you might think we're done. Not so. Looking at the instructions, we see that we still have steps 10 and 11, telling us to reconnect the speakers and enjoy the music. Connecting the speakers was easy, but did I enjoy the music? Stay tuned for the next video to find out. A quick spoiler though, much like a Hollywood romance, it starts out complicated but has a happy ending. To stay updated, please subscribe and click the bell. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. I'll see you soon.